right, can everybody hear me? Awesome. So I'm David Stanek. I'm here to talk to you about becoming a OpenStack developer and give you some overview of what that means. Um, I've been at Rackspace since 2013. Basically, Rackspace and NASA started OpenStack in about 2010 to create the foundations of an open cloud. Um, to this day, Rackspace still does a lot of contributions, which is what they pay me to do. I'm not going to really talk about Rackspace, but I may use them in examples just because that's what I'm familiar with. So I'm not trying to advertise them, it's just that's what I know. Um, I've been a Keystone developer for the last year and a half, and Keystone is an authorization authentication system part of OpenStack. Um, so I have a lot of experience with the development cycles, the processes, the code review cycles. Um, that's kind of what I'm going to go over today. So cloud technologies are probably the most disruptive and transformative technology today. I mean, it's changing the way everything works you know, in the last two or three years. And it would be a shame if we left that open to uh, just a few companies to guide the direction of the cloud. So that's why I think OpenStack and the open cloud is such an important thing. And that's why I think we need a lot of your help to build it and make it better. Um, so my goal here is to get you excited and ultimately involved in some way um, to help with the, the effort of building the open cloud. Uh, what I want to tell you isn't 100% true. I'm going to cover um, everything in detail, but I'm going to leave out some confusing details. I want to smooth over some rough edges. Um, and if you're familiar with OpenStack or OpenStack development, you might be thinking, hey, that's not entirely true. And that's just because I'm trying not to confuse everybody. So who's heard of OpenStack? Raise your hand. Oh, awesome. Um, how many of you have actually used OpenStack as a part of a public or a private cloud? Ooh, not many, okay. So um, I want to explain what OpenStack is, but I will um, try to explain some of the architecture and some of the, the deeper pieces here. So OpenStack is really big. There's a lot of components to it. Um, I mean, it's basically implementing the cloud. Um, so I'm not going to be able to go into as much detail as I would want to, to uh, bring you up to speed with the architecture. Uh, but I do want to give you a context of what you'll be developing in if you do start to develop OpenStack. So you'll have to understand like, where your piece fits in the puzzle and how everything interacts. Um, and there's a few important things that I'll go over. And most of this is basically a summary of my first couple weeks as an OpenStack developer. So I am presenting this as a developer. I'm a software engineer by trade. And that's what I get paid to do. Um, the workflow itself that I'm going to talk about isn't specific to developers. All the documentation, the infrastructure tooling, and a bunch of other things actually follow the same kind of workflow. I want to focus on the code, but there are lots of other ways to contribute. Documentation, bug triaging, and a bunch of other activities. If you're a DevOps guy, there's Chef, Puppet, Ansible projects that help deploy the cloud that need help. So what I, what I am going to cover today is just general technical architecture, high level how things work, some of the social architecture, which I think is probably the most interesting part of OpenStack, uh, the people and the processes. I'm um, going to talk a little bit about DevSec, which is a development environment that actually allows you to spin up a cloud on a VM so that you can test your code. I'm going to go over a couple different contributor workflows. We're going to uh, see how we could make a change and submit it to code review, see what code reviews look like, um, see how we can download a change that we need to update and then update it and send it back to code review. And then I'm hoping we have enough time for questions because I'm going to leave a lot of open-ended things here because there, there's so much to cover. But I'm not covering how to make a production cloud. There's a lot of operational stuff out there about how to do that. And I'm not going to be covering how applications are built on top of cloud resources. I'm actually talking about building the cloud itself. So there's a couple things that you just are going to have to know as you start getting into OpenStack. I'm not going to be covering these things in detail, just the, the fact that they exist. Uh, most of OpenStack is implemented in Python, so that's a programming language of choice for most of the projects that we'll talk about. All the source control, control is in Git, so all the software development artifacts, um, documentation and uh, configuration tooling, that's all in Git. OpenStack only runs on Linux at this point, so you'll have to fire up a VM somewhere, either in the cloud or in VirtualBox on your machine, install Linux on it to actually be able to develop on OpenStack. And this is one that I use personally. I use Vagrant a lot to manage my VMs. Some people hate it, some people love it. Um, but I find it makes it very easy for me to spin up or destroy VMs so that I can experiment with things. And I can do it with minimal configuration, 
and do it from a command line, which is where I'm most comfortable. So all that said, if you have all those things or understand what those things are, then you're in really good shape here. Um, so like I said, OpenStack is huge. It's a full cloud system. Um, so we'll be basically touching on the edges of the architecture a little bit, just so you understand how things are grouped together and, and how things interact. So a real simple architecture diagram. Looks like a three-tier diagram, but it's kind of at a different level of abstraction. You have a, a cloud tier that sits on top of your hardware and applications that sit on top of the cloud tier. And the cloud tier itself is really broken down into this kind of conceptual model, a bunch of subsystems that interact over APIs. So if you think about all the functions of a cloud, like VMs and DNS and all the different things that make up what your current workflow might be, those things are all broken up into separate subsystems, and those sub subsystems communicate over our JSON REST API. Now here you can see all the subsystems and some of the touch points. There's a lot more that are hidden because it would be too many to actually put on this particular diagram. Um, but when you're developing, you'll pick one of those subsystems that you want to specialize in based on kind of your interest in security or, or uh, virtualization or whatever, and that's the, the focus you'll have. So if you pick Keystone here at the bottom, which is the, the thing that I work on, when I work on it, I work on Keystone and I develop on Keystone, but I have to understand all the touch points into my particular area so that I know that this other system is going to make these calls. I need to make sure those things still work. So even though I tested my change, I have to make sure I understand the whole uh, system. This slide, you don't really have to see the details. You probably can't see the details. But each one of those big boxes represents one of those conceptual subsystems. And so each one of these things is actually broken down again into a set of services and data stores that cooperate to uh, implement some kind of feature within OpenStack. And this is only a portion of them. There's probably about three times as many boxes if you had a full diagram of what OpenStack provides. So there's a lot of complexity, and you, you really have to understand what stuff you're working on. Um, so most of OpenStack is divided up into a bunch of web services. Uh, those web services have a JSON, REST API that are used to implement or um, trigger different behaviors across the systems. The individual web services themselves, for the most part, are very single purposed. So they do one thing, they do one thing well, and then they delegate some other responsibilities to other parts of the cloud. So you have a very cooperative set of services. Um, generally speaking, they don't implement a lot of the lower level things and they wrap them inside of better APIs. So for instance, Nova is what creates virtual machines. Nova doesn't actually implement a hypervisor. Nova uses different hypervisors based on what the cloud provider had set up. And the user doesn't have to know whether it's the open source KVM or commercial VMware. They use the Nova APIs to trigger VMs to be booted or destroyed. And again, again, everything is implemented in Python. So you'll have to uh, start working with Python code if you haven't already. So there's a lot of services that make up the cloud. And this is just a, a few of them. Um, but any particular instance of a cloud could use one or more of these services. It's just whatever the cloud provider decides to um, expose as a service to their customers. And I'm not going to go through each one of these, but what I would say is that you can go to the main wiki page for OpenStack, take a look at these services and figure out if one of them is something that kind of piques your interest. Whether you're interested in networking, you'd want to look at Neutron. If you're interested in virtualization, Nova is a great place to start. And there's just a whole bunch of things um, in the cloud space that you could take a look at and get involved with. Each one of the services has a corresponding client. Um, so the client is the thing that actually um, talks out to the service so the user doesn't have to understand the REST API. All the official clients are in Python. Um, and they're divided really into two parts. The library code, which is the code that will go out and actually do the work on behalf of the user, tell the service to do some kind of behavior or return data back to the user. And then the command line interface, which is the um, part that allows you to go onto like a bash shell and actually ask for a VM to be created or to authenticate. Um, there's also a shared client that will be soon replacing the command line interfaces for the rest of the clients. The shared OpenStack client is um, useful because it allows people not to care which client they have to use. So right now, if you want to boot a VM, you have to know to use the Nova client. If you want to authenticate, you need to know to use the Keystone client. In the future, you'll just have to know what action you want to take, and the OpenStack client will figure out which service to go to. And there's a, a ton of OpenStack clients out there for a variety of different languages and platforms. So 
um, customers are able to use Go or C or Java against OpenStack. I just don't think any of those are officially supported at this point. Um, so I've been probably oscillating between projects and services a little bit. In this context, a project is a true software development project. It's got source control, it's got um, a bug tracker, it's got its own documentation, it's, it's a real software project. A service is just one of those projects. So within Keystone, for instance, there's probably a half a dozen projects that we have that make up the entire Keystone project, the, the Keystone um, team. So these are di the different types of projects that we have. We have core projects, which are part of the integrated release. So OpenStack releases every six months with a named release, and all the projects that are considered core get cut and get part of that release. And that's what, what you would download from uh, the CentOS repositories or Ubuntu repositories, the, the actual release that was cut. Um, those core projects have a strict schedule that people had to adhere to. There's a lot of rules for what they have to do and what they're allowed to use um, as far as software goes. Um, but given that they listen to those rules and they, they abide by the schedule, they get a lot of resources available to them for continuous integration, different infrastructural pieces. Um, there's documentation teams that cross all of OpenStack that write documentation. And so that's a huge benefit for the core projects. There's also incubated projects, which are projects that are going to be core eventually. So a lot of things are popping up around OpenStack, like I want to be able to use uh, Docker and I want to be able to do this and do that. So people make up a new project on GitHub or whatever, and you know they're trying to make it something that's useful. Once it gets to critical mass, they usually apply to be an incubated project, which means that they start getting looked at by the, the uh, OpenStack group to see what they're using, how they're using it. They start having to follow some of those rules, um, including kind of getting onto a release schedule. And in trade-off, they start getting some of those additional resources um, for continuous integration and infrastructure. And as a big benefit, they're able to start using the OpenStack branding. So only the core projects are really allowed to say, hey, we're OpenStack this, OpenStack that, which is pretty powerful when you start talking about marketing. So incubated projects are trying to get into that mode. Library projects are exactly what it sounds like. They're effectively libraries that are used by other parts of OpenStack. The different clients, like Keystone Client, Nova Client, those all fit in part of that uh, library project category. They're not released when the integrated releases, they can be released whenever, a critical bug fix, they can be released within an hour. Um, and there's a bunch of things related to clients and shared libraries that, that fit in this category. Gating projects are, um, and we'll learn more about gating in a few minutes, but gating projects are part of our software development life cycle. So when commits happen, you can't actually commit to master directly. It has to go through a series of reviews and tests. And part of those tests is the gating tests. And there's a bunch of projects that are related to you know, DevStack, Tempest is the QA testing tool, and a bunch of other stuff that help make that process work. And those are gating projects. And there's lots of other supporting projects that just help in the life cycle. Uh, the ones I listed are documentation and infrastructure, but there's uh, other things that kind of help in the software development life cycle. There's tools that help with code review and other uh, developer niceties. So the social architecture, this is what I find most interesting. Um, just due to the total amount of contributors and contributions, uh, there's thousands of people committing code and probably dozens to hundreds of commits a day that are actually getting merged throughout OpenStack. It's just amazing the whole thing kind of works together and doesn't have the same kind of problems I've seen in companies where teams are a lot smaller. Um, the social structures, very simple and it's all electric, uh, elected, so it's based on meritocracy. It's not, you know, your company can't put you in a certain position. Um, OpenStack itself has a foundation which deals with legal stuff, branding stuff, kind of the enterprise-y business stuff that I don't really pay attention too much to. Um, but the board of directors are elected by the group of contributors to OpenStack and they handle doing all of that kind of boring work. There's also an elected technical committee which you can kind of think of as enterprise architects for OpenStack. They help look at OpenStack as a whole and the technology that's, that's uh, being used and kind of set directions for the next cycle, which is a six month period release. Um, once you get past that, you have all the different project teams. So each project team has an elected PTL, which is basically like the head cat herder. They're 
responsible for doing the releases, for uh, making sure that things go out on time, that all the responsibilities of the project are met throughout the release cycle. Um, every six months we hold that election so that they, we can keep shifting people in and out of those positions. People tend to burn out as they're PTL for too long. And then you have the project core and, and contributors. And these are the main people that are doing code reviews and commits to the project. The project cores are elected by other project cores. So if people look at the quality of your work, the quality of the reviews that you're doing, and decide whether or not you should be part of that core group to approve code. And that's the, the biggest difference between a, a regular contributor and a project core, is that project cores are allowed to actually approve code to be merged. So if you're just a regular contributor, you can say this code looks good or looks bad, but you don't have any power to actually block or merge code. Uh, and part of that is the responsibility to actually do the code reviews. So as people um, transition from contributors to core, you start doing less and less code and real software work and doing more and more reviews to help move the project along. Contributors are probably uh, the biggest group. Uh, for Keystone that I work in, I think there's 11 or 12 cores and there's probably two or three times that contributors on a monthly basis. So I'll talk a little bit about Keystone, but the, the same thing is hold true to all the different teams, but I'll give you some details about my particular team. So we have people that are from Texas, California, Massachusetts, Ohio, I'm part of the team. But we also have people from um, New Zealand and England that are part of our core group. Uh, we have contributors from India, China, Brazil, um, and a bunch of other different places. So obviously communication is a big deal. We have to figure out how to communicate properly. Uh, written communication is the, probably the preferred way because there's a record of it happening and you can be very careful in what you say. And when you're you know, talking to someone in person, you can often just off the cuff say remarks that might be construed as bad by other cultures. Um, so we have a bunch of different resources for that. Mailing lists are probably the, the biggest one to use when you're doing cross-team things. So if I want to surface a subject like, hey, we're doing stuff wrong from a performance perspective and get ideas from different parts of the community, I'd make a mailing list post for that kind of topic. But we also spend a lot, a lot, a lot of time in IRC. So that's um, pretty much like when you're sitting there in a cube and you talk over the cube ball to somebody else. We do that same thing, but we do it in IRC. So you can go into an individual team room and see that people during their normal working hours are sitting there in IRC answering questions, talking about design, talking about reviews. To a lesser extent, we have people that will um, need phone calls or Google Hangouts so that you can do whiteboarding or some live interactions. But ultimately, we try to capture that inside of some written communication somewhere. And then we have um, a lot of face-to-face -face meetings. So, Every six months we have a summit, which is basically the huge design session across OpenStack where we have sessions for Keystone where we discuss the next six months, what we're gonna build, who's gonna build it. And then we also have cross-session things where we talk about cross-topics, like um, we have a request ID that goes across all the services that gets passed around so you can track a request through all the different services. So you'd have a session about those kinds of things. And those are all face-to-face -face so that you can actually hash things out very quickly and then we um, actually put those outcomes in either the mailing list post or Etherpad or some other place where it's recorded. And then we have mid-cycles which are in between reviews or in, in between summits. So if the summit's every six months, the mid-cycles are right in between those so that we can actually sit down and those turn into more of a hackathon where we actually pair up and do code on particular hard things. We'll do pair reviewing, reviewing on something that's a really big or really gnarly review and we kind of discuss the progress. It's kind of like an agile scrum almost, but every three months. Code reviews are the, the most important part of the process just because we have lots of contributions coming in, but how do you know that they're high quality and how do you know they're in line with the direction of the actual project? And so we have a process that looks something like this. And it's actually pretty simple and pretty, um, pretty close to a GitHub flow if you're familiar with using GitHub. The first step is that we're pulling the, the actual clone down from somewhere. So we actually have a local copy. We do some amount of development work locally, make a bunch of commits or do whatever we need to do to, to add the feature. And then when we're ready to go, we use a tool called git review to actually push that up to the code review system. 
And some of this we'll go into a little more detail in a, in a few slides. And the act of pushing that to code review actually kicks off a couple different things. The first one is an automated process, which um, is driven by some infrastructure tooling around Jenkins. And it actually does a bunch of unit tests, style checks, integration tests, functional tests against the commit. So every single commit that gets pushed off is always tested. And so the, the result of this is it's going to tell Jenkins, or it's going to tell Garrett, plus one this passed, or minus one this did not pass. At the same time, there's going to be reviews going on from humans. So um, in Keystone's case, every time a re review comes in, we actually get a post in our chat room that says, hey, this review is here and with a link to the review. So people get to see it right away. And so people are able to go in, and there's discussions in the review process. Everybody's probably done code reviews in the past. Um, and if either the tests fail or the code reviews fail, those things get kicked back to the developer so they can start the cycle again and then re-push re the patch to be reviewed. If they are successful and the tests pass and the reviewers say it was good, it gets approved and then goes into a different testing pipeline. So still, none of this code is actually in master. No one else can download it unless they go to the code review system. It's just part of that review process. So it goes into this gate queue where they run a bunch of tests against all the other commits that are going to be merged so that they can find different um, breakpoints. Like if I commit something to Keystone that will break some of the newer Nova functionality, they'll be able to find that stuff through a bunch of testing. So it goes through a battery of tests, and if those get um, through OK, it actually gets merged into master. And then it's available for the next developer to get pool. So code reviews themselves are actually really simple. Uh, core developers can plus two a change, which means that they probably looked at it in great detail, tested the change out, ran the test against the change, and agree with the approach. They can also minus two a change, which means that there's no way this can merge. The, the tooling will not let anything merge that has a negative two review associated with it, um, just as a matter of, of uh, the process. Anybody, core reviewers and non-core reviewers, can go through plus one or minus one a change. Plus one is like, hey, this looks good. Minus one means that it does not look good. And either way, it's always helpful to leave comments on why you think it's good or it's bad so that the reviewer knows what they need to do if they need to do something. And there's a blank score of zero if you don't actually score anything. Most of the time, this just happens automatically because it's the default when you go and just make a comment. So if you don't actually want to review the code and just want to make a comment like, hey, you should see this other review, it'll come out with a score of zero. So non-cores are able to go in and, and actually start reviewing. So if, you're, if you know Python or want to learn Python, it's a good thing to just start looking at the reviews and understanding kind of the, the stream of changes coming in. Um, but the non-core reviews, even though they're taking into consideration, they're not actually taking into consideration for the merge process. You can still merge something that a non-core had said that they don't really like. So we have a basic need to, to test our code, right? So all the projects have unit tests and they have functional tests. So you're able to go out and test your code, but it's not as useful as testing in the context of the actual system that you're building. So if I make a change in my project and all the tests pass it within that project, it doesn't mean I didn't break anybody else in the cloud. And since it's a really big ecosystem with so many changes happening per cycle, it's always useful to actually test your changes within a running cloud. Um, and DevStack is the tool that allows me to actually create a local cloud in a VM that I can run tests against. So DevStack only officially supports a few operating systems because it is a set of shell scripts and it's really complicated to support every package manager that people want to support. Um, but installing DevStack is actually really easy and I'll go through the steps in more detail. But you, you pick the OS you want, you create a VM and install your OS, you download the DevStack code, do a little bit of configuration, which typically is not a whole lot to, to get up and running, and then you start the process. I included a URL up there. There's a URL devstack.org where it gives you all the detailed instructions and all the configuration values um, that you could possibly use to set up your cloud. In my case, I said earlier that I use Vagrant for everything, so I'm gonna use Vagrant here. And I've already set up a Fedora 20 uh, base box for myself, so that's something you'd have to do out of band. Um, but I created this directory, and I cd into the directory, and I run vagrant init there. That'll drop down a configuration file that'll describe how it's going to build a VM, but it doesn't actually do any work at that point. 
And then I'll run Vagrant SSH, which will actually go through and build the cloud, or build the, uh, build the VM, and SSH into the, the VM itself. So once I'm in the VM, Fedora 20 doesn't have, or at least the base box I use, doesn't have Git installed, so I'll install Git. I'll clone the dev stack repository so that I get the dev stack code, and then I'll CD into the dev stack directory. So now we have a running VM, we have all the code downloaded from dev stack, and it's simply a matter of configuring it and running the, the start script. And so I won't go through all the different ways you can configure dev stack. I'll, I'll just show you a little bit here about the passwords. If you don't put the passwords in, it'll actually ask you for passwords interactively, which is kind of a pain sometimes. And probably the most important thing when you're starting to develop is to enable the right services. So this is the default configuration which enables most of the OpenStack services. But DevStack allows you to pick and choose the OpenStack services that you want to run. So if you're a Keystone developer like me, I typically only run Keystone and Horizon within my dev stack. It keeps my footprint down. I, I can get by with only two gigs of RAM on a VM, so I can run it on my MacBook Air. And I don't really have all this extra stuff that I don't need cluttering up the system. You can, of course, use whichever things, uh, services you want based on the projects that you're actually using. And the start script just starts the cloud. At this point, it's going to go through. It's going to install all the dependency packages like Apache and all the servers that, that are used within the cloud. It's going to download all of the code uh, for, the pack, for the services that you said you wanted enabled. So if it was Keystone and Horizon, it's going to go download the code for those things and put them into slash ops slash stack. And then once everything is downloaded, everything is installed, it's going to go through and start the services and configure them with some initial data. So this will give you a cloud that you can actually start using the clients against and provision VMs or if you install Trove, create a new MySQL database. Takes quite a while. So the first run of Stack, especially when it installs and downloads all the software, takes 10 to 15 minutes on a fairly fast machine. Uh, if I install all the services that were in that initial enabled on this MacBook Air, it takes about 35 minutes, uh, which is crazy, but it does. And then at the very end, you get something that looks like this. It shows you the IP address of the actual cloud itself. And in this case, th these screenshots are actually from a public cloud VM. Since I installed Horizon, it shows me the URL to get to Horizon. Horizon is the GUI for OpenStack. It'll, it's like the control panel as you log into it uh, through a web interface and do all the different cloud actions, provision resources, remove resources. Uh, you almost always have to have Keystone running since it's the authentication authorization system with almost all the services. It shows the URL to Keystone. This URL is typically going to be part of the URL that you use to configure the clients on the command line. Uh, and then it's going to show you the, the passwords and stuff that were created. And this is based off of your configuration file. So now we have a cloud installed. And so that's kind of cool, but what does that really mean? Like, what, what can you do with it? Well, in reality, depending on the services, you have a full cloud. You can do anything you can do on, say, the Rackspace public cloud or any other cloud that you use within your little dev stack VM test things out, uh, write some code against uh, Keystone or Nova, and then make sure those changes work in, in the entire system. So DevStack offers a, does everybody know what screen is? Yeah, I see a lot of heads. So DevStack offers a screen session when, it, when you start the stack that basically allows you to very easily debug and look at what's going on within your cloud. So you can see on the bottom here is a bunch of different windows. Each window has um, something useful in it. The first one's a shell, so you can actually do just normal command stuff. The second one is the dstat output, so you can watch what's happening as you do actions against your cloud. And the rest of them are basically log tails of things that are going on within your cloud. So this is an example of the keystone log as I was doing some actions. And you can see the list of windows is basically the same as the list of enabled services. So any service that you enable, you'll get a window here so that you can see some of the debug output. And in certain cases, like you can see in Keystone, there's actually two different windows that monitor two different parts of uh, log files. So now we have a cloud, um, and we have service code downloaded because DevStack actually downloaded the code that we we're interested in. Um, what do we do? So I want to go through a couple of quick assumptions that I'm going to make here. Um, in order to contribute code back as part of a developer workflow, you have to have signed the contributor license agreement. So there's, like I said, the foundation does legally stuff. 
we need to make sure that anything that we accept is legally yours to give us as part of a contribution. I'm going to assume that you have a launchpad.com account. Launchpad is the um, canonical uh, system for like bug tracking and stuff like that. They use it in Ubuntu and, and most of the canonical projects. Uh, it's also free. And OpenStack uses it as part of its OAuth system to do authentications. And then you have our review.openstack.org account. This is our Garrett instance that does our code reviews. And you would go here, register using your Launchpad ID, you do, do the little OAuth dance, and then you'd have a review account. And then there's some software that you'll see in some of my screenshots. Um, Vim is the only one that you don't necessarily need to have. That's my editor of choice, so you'll see um, some of the screenshots have Vim, but you can use any editor that Git will pop up for you in, in Linux. Um, Git Review is the tool that does the actual Garrett integration. So it'll actually integrate your local system with Garrett. And Tox is the tool that runs commands within different environments in Python. So um, if you want to run unit tests, those are actually controlled by Tox so that we can fire up a different version of Python. Um, so we can run tests against 2.3 or, or 2.3, 2.7 or 3.3 or 3.4. And there's probably a few more things that I forgot to mention, but you'll see them in the screenshots. Also, uh, for people familiar with Git, uh, there's a, you always do a git commit amend when you're doing code reviews within Garrett, and I've aliased that to git amend, so you'll see me using git amend in most of the screenshots. Okay, so now what? We have a cloud, we have code, what things do we actually want to do? And this is the point where you'd pick a project that you're interested in. So I'm going to go with Keystone just because that's what I'm used to and that's what my screenshots are about, but you can apply the same thing to any project that, that you find interesting in OpenStack. And then you would look through the project bug tracker for low-hanging fruit or wish list bugs, something that it's deemed easy to kind of get started with the process. And then once you figure out what you want to work on, it's time to actually work on it and create a change to push to review. So we're going to make a real quick edit to, to some code. Then we're going to use git review to push it up to code review and kind of look at what that, what that looks like. So we're in the ops stack keystone directory. This is where the code was checked out for us. Oh, oh, oh. This is where the code was checked out. Um, I made some edits. You know, we don't have to care what the edits were, but effectively I removed Python 3.3 support and added proper support for Python 3.4 in our Tox INI. And then I committed the, the change. So at this point I did an inline comment just because it wasn't a big deal and uh, most people trust me enough to just let this kind of stuff slide. But in general, when you do a, a commit message, you're gonna put some rationale as to why you're, you're making this particular change. And, and then if we look at the git show of that commit we made, we'll find something kind of weird. We didn't actually put this change ID, but somehow it got inserted in there for us. And this is what happens when uh, git review is installed. It'll actually install a post commit hook that'll uh, look at a, any commit and make sure that if it doesn't have a change ID, one is added. If the change ID already exists, it just leaves it alone. And the change ID is important for Garrett because if you're familiar with git amends, the uh, amend process of changing the commit will change the hash, so it looks like a different commit to git. So Garrett needs some way to know these changes are related. So as long as this change ID doesn't change, it knows that this is a new revision of an existing patch. And we, we're gonna need to test our code. So this command from Tox will actually run the Python 2.7 tests. So it runs all the unit tests in Python 2.7. We have Tox targets for 3.3 and 3.4 and some other stuff. Uh, but typically 2.7 is what we care most about at this point. And then it runs the PEP8 style checks. So when you run this command, we'll get a bunch of unit tests. You can see the individual tests as they scroll by. If for some reason this fails, you need to go back, fix it, and keep iterating until you get something successful. Ideally, you're gonna come up with something that looks like this. And you're gonna get successful um, tests and successful style checks. So at that point, it's ready to go. So we'll do a git review. And the simple act of calling git review in this repository will take the change that you've committed and push it up to Garrett for review. So now it's actually public, and it gave us a URL to go and visit that review. So at this point, it's kind of scary because now your code and your work is now public for thousands of people to take a look at and ridicule. But it's actually not a bad process. How many people do code reviews right now in their current 
employer. That's a good amount. How many think that code reviews would make their software better? Okay, so um, I can definitely say that it does make it better. It makes it harder to do, but it definitely does make it better. So we'll look at a review, and this may be hard to see uh, for people in the back, but the actual details don't matter as much as what stuff is actually in the review. So this is the review we just pushed up. This is the commit message and the change ID, information about the author, the dates, the branches, the status, and the actual reviews themselves. So when someone actually votes on your review, there'll be a list of all the votes, so you can take a look at um, who had what to say about your particular review. And then for every single file that changed, there's a detailed diff that you can go into, take a look at comments line by line on what you like and what you don't like. Uh, part of Garrett is lists of reviews that you've done that you need to do because there's incoming reviews for your team um, and reviews that have been completed and what the end status was. So in this case, this is my list of outgoing reviews, the ones that I've actually submitted for other people. Um, you can see the, the, first, the title itself is the first line of the commit message. It tells us the project. You can see there's a couple different projects that I have review, outstanding reviews for. It shows you the branch and the topic. So the topic is the local branch that, that you're developing under. And then it shows you the actual vote. So you can see the code review vote, the lowest vote. You can see um, the actual verified vote, which is the testing vote. And you can see whatever the workflow is. And workflow is a really simple thing that basically indicates whether or not it's work in progress or already approved. If you see the X, that means that the developer marked it as work in progress. So I'll often submit a change to review that's not ready yet. So I want to tell other people don't waste time here. And so I'll mark it as a whip. Or you'll see a check mark that says this thing's already approved. Don't even bother looking at it because it's going to be merged soon. So a couple of interesting things. Commit messages, there's a regex that actually looks through for blueprints, which are kind of like uh, specifications, uh, links to bugs and other stuff. And then hyperlinks it automatically to the source. You can see the, the actual tests that ran. So each one of these lines here is one of the testing um, builds that went through and did some kind of test. And if they failed, you'd see failure and you'd see uh, that you can click the hyperlink to go look at the details of the failure so you can figure it out. And then many of the changes that you're going to deal with are going to be part of a chain. So you're going to have dependencies or other things are going to depend on that particular chain or change. So you're going to be able to see what those dependencies look like. So that's probably the, the, the most important the process, part of the process. And for me as a, a core reviewer, I spend most of my time inside of Garrett doing code reviews for other people. Um, so that's one of those tools that you definitely want to familiar, familiarize yourself with. Based on the outcome of those reviews, you may have to go and modify an existing change. So it's very simple. You're just using the same git review tool, but you tell it what change you want to modify. So here we're just telling it to download this particular change. It's going to create a local branch and check it out with that change inside of it. And if we look at a quick git show, it shows you that particular commit that we downloaded. And then it allows us to go through and do whatever we need to do. So in this case, I did a really quick edit. This file was missing the Apache license header, so I just added the, the license header back into it. Quick git status shows that I did make a change and everything um, looks how I expect. And then I'm going to git amend it so that I change that existing commit to include my new change. And the outcome of that is going to be um, a simple one ref change over to Garrett. So now the code review is updated in Garrett. People in the IRC room got the information they need to know that says the change was updated. And the cycle can begin again. So so, I mean, so far this is pretty simple, straightforward. It's not that much different than a GitHub flow. Um, we'll look at a quick larger example. Um, I talked about the chains of commits where you're going to actually make four or five commits on top of each other. Um, most of the time you'll do this because it makes breaking up the work easier, it makes the reviews easier. Instead of having one 10,000 line commit, you have, say, five smaller commits that kind of tell the story of what you're building. Um, so when you do stuff like that, you're going to need to, to understand uh, a couple different aspects of Git. So real quickly, we'll check out a change set that, or a, a chain that I've made. We're going to pull it down, and it's going to pull down 13 different, uh, 13 different commits as part of this branch. 
And when I do a quick short log on it, you'll see that I did check out the branch and that these are all the hashes that were downloaded. So there's a bunch of Python 3 stuff that were downloaded. So Git Interactive Rebase is probably like the magic tool. This is what I use all the time when you're doing a lot of work with Git. Does everybody know what that is? I see a lot of head shaking. Okay, so I won't describe that too much because it's, it's kind of a bit to describe, but I, I'll describe it as part of the process here. So I've decided that the earliest change that I want to make is a certain revision because I have to make a, a modification to it. So I pick the revision right before it and I interactively rebase to it. So what that does is give me a screen that shows me all the different commits that are going to be affected by this rebase and the command that's going to be run against this. So by default, it's pick. So if I close this file right now, it's just going to reapply everything and um, it's like nothing ever happened. But there's a bunch of other commands that you could use to change the behavior of what rebase is doing. So in our particular case, I needed to reword one of the commit messages. And I needed to edit two other commits. So as soon as I save this, Git is going to roll out all of these changes, put in the first one, and then drop me into an editor where I can modify the commit message because I told it I wanted to reword it. So I reword this. I close the file, and it's going to automatically save that commit and add all the, picked all the picked commits after that up until the point where we get to the edit. And it's going to leave me in a branch um, with that last edit as the last commit there. So you're going to make a change. You're going to do a git amend and do rebase continue so that you can actually submit that and tell rebase to keep going. And then it's going to basically just roll that change up push it in, and then pull all the picked ones after that till it gets to the next edit. Uh, the cycle repeats. And after you get through all of that and you've made all the changes you need to make and rewording you need to make, you'll see something that looks like this to show that it was successful. Uh, so now we have 13 commits that we've modified. So hopefully we've fixed all the code review issues. So we're going to tell git review that we want to review it again. So it's the same simple command with the difference of it will see the fact that it's going to push multiple commits and it's going to make sure that that's really what you want to do. And if it is what you want to do, just type yes, and it's going to push all those commits up. And you can see here we had uh, 13 commits that were actually updated. So now in our chat room, unfortunately, we'll have 13 individual messages saying that each one of these things was updated. But the reviewers are then triggered to go in and you know, see if those things were to their satisfaction so that we can get these things merged. So hopefully you're still with me, because I know that was a lot. And that last example was complicated. Um, but I wanted to, to add it, because that was probably the first thing that tripped me up. Like most of the code review process, when you're doing a single review, is the simplest thing imaginable. You just run one command. But you almost immediately find yourself using chains of commits. So that becomes a really important thing to learn. So we talked about the technical architecture. We talked about the social architecture. So Hopefully you can kind of see where you would fit in if you, if you dove into a specific project and what you'd have to look for. Uh, we talked about DevStack and what that is and how you would use it. And we learned a couple different ways to push changes up into Garrett and looked at Garrett a little bit for how code reviews actually work. So hopefully everybody is able to uh, go back to their, their uh, uh, laptop, start setting stuff up and start hacking with us because that would be awesome. The actual documentation for most of this is at this URL. Um, there's a lot of steps that, that I glossed over, like the CLA and setting up the accounts and all that kind of stuff, because it would take hours and hours and hours to go through all the different things. Um, if you just sat through the document, it probably takes an hour and a half to do everything. But you don't need to do everything to get started. You just need to have a couple of those accounts that I listed in the beginning. And this describes how to, how to set that stuff up. All right, so that's the end. Um, so I wanted to save time for questions and kind of discuss any of those things that we um, left as open-ended things, because I know I didn't go into detail about everything. Does anybody have questions? So OpenStack is self-sufficient, so there's there's Rackspace involvement. Uh, they pay me to work on OpenStack. They do um, products around OpenStack. Uh, they do donate resources like VMs and stuff for OpenStack developers to use. 
but the actual releases themselves are controlled by the OpenStack group. But they use the OpenStack code. Yes. To yes, Rackspace uses the OpenStack cloud. Yeah, so I mean, there's different, and I cut some of the slides out about how to run it, but you have public cloud like Rackspace, or you go to Rackspace, or you go to AWS, or one of, one of the cloud providers, and you sign up to provision cloud resources. And then you have private cloud, where your company wants to run its own cloud on its own hardware so that it's separate from everybody else, and you would run OpenStack there. And then there's providers like Rackspace and others that provide private cloud services, and the the big benefit there is that if you have a private cloud as a business, you have the ability to burst into public cloud for certain types of use cases. So Rackspace does use OpenStack to provide those kinds of services. Yes. Yep. Yeah, that's the benefit of having an open cloud is you have open APIs that are very easy um, to use that span across multiple different clouds. So there's a big initiative right now in OpenStack to do federation where um, you might decide Rackspace is the best cloud in the US, but there's another provider that's the best cloud in Asia, and you have a global presence. So you can, if they're both OpenStack clouds, you can use the same tooling to span across those clouds uh, if you had a federated environment. Um, if you're using something like, and I don't want to pick on Amazon, but if you're using Amazon, you can't have your own internal cloud using their exact APIs and then burst out to Amazon. You're gonna have to have two separate tool sets. Other questions? Okay, that's all I have for, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>